What do you think about a book that has a whole chapter called Al-Fatih, which means the manifest victory, the great victory. And it starts with this verse. Surely we have granted you a manifest victory. And this victory is not in any battle. It is a, it is a peace treaty called Al-Hudaybiyah Peace Treaty. What do you think about a book that calls a peace treaty a manifest victory? Is it promoting peace or war? What do you think about a religion that teaches its followers that the best names are the beautiful names of God? One of them is As-Salam, peace. And the worst names, according to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, there's a saying that he says, peace be upon him, the nastiest two names are war and bitterness. Never use them to name your children. What do you think about a religion that teaches its followers that the best name is peace and the worst name is war. Is it promoting peace or war? So actually, I can conclude by saying Islam is a religion of justice. Justice should be established through peaceful means. When Muslims fail to establish justice through peaceful means, then they find no other alternative but going to war and they are allowed then to go to war if they fail to establish justice through peaceful means. Like that, we finished our uh, presentation. And I don't know if we open the floor for questions or if you have something else. Let me warn them <laughs> before they ask. <laughs> now there's a warning actually. Muslims believe that in Islam there are no weaknesses whatsoever. No weak points. That's not because Muslims are arrogant. But it's because Muslims believe that every ideology takes the characteristics of the founder of the ideology. So whatever is human is imperfect, because the human is imperfect. It can be beautiful, but imperfect. Whatever is divine is perfect, because the divine is perfect. God is perfect. And we believe that Islam is the religion of God. So we believe that Islam is perfect. And I'm saying this because I want you to open your heart and throw on us any question that you have. No question is impolite to say. No question is inappropriate. So please open your heart and throw on us anything that you may have heard or read. Actually, we appreciate so much the non-Muslim brothers and sisters who came today and allowed us to talk to them about ourselves. Because okay, many, many, yes, yes, let me continue. Because, <laughs> because, because many other people, when they want to acquire knowledge about Islam, they go and listen to third parties. If you want to know how a dish tastes, ask someone who tasted that dish not someone who never tasted that dish. So let's start with the first question. Okay. Yes. Um, you talk us today about the Islamic religion, but um, you believe, and um, but um, the same thing was um, told in the documentary. It's called um, "What the West Needs to Know." What? What? What the West needs to know. Okay. It's called. Yeah, yeah, by Robert Spencer. I'm sorry? It's by Robert Spencer. Okay. What the West needs to know about Islam. Yeah, I know them all. Okay, so that's exactly the opposite. Exactly. Of what you told. Exactly. So okay, very good. I'll tell you what. I tell you who to to uh, to believe. <laughs> Robert Spencer, like Herr Fenders, like all of those. They use a game called the cut and paste game. When you ask me about my cat, I'll tell you she's pretty ugly. 
I mean that my cat is relatively ugly. If you cut just one word, ugly, what's left is she's pretty. 180% degrees opposite. That's exactly what they do. I have a presentation actually about fitna as a case study. I studied it first, the film fitna, and I show people what hair filters did to them, to non-Muslims, fooling you guys. And I can show that to you right now if you want in five minutes. I bring you the verse as he brought to you. And I show you the whole verse in the Quran. And I show you the blue parts which he cut off out of this verse. And I show you with this part what does the verse mean and without it what does it mean. And you will see that he was fooling you, not fooling Muslims. Muslims just go out and go angry, protest in the streets. And I disagree with this totally, even if it's a peaceful <coughs> protest. Don't protest in the streets, even peacefully, because we don't look beautiful when we are angry. <laughs> and cameramen take pictures for us when we're angry, and they use it in newspapers saying, sure, Muslims are angry, Muslims are crazy. All what Muslims need to do is to invite non-Muslims and show them what happened. Herr Filbus brought you this as a verse, but it, there's no verse like that. The verse is like four lines, and this is what it means, completely opposite. The same verse is completely opposite what he, what, what he tried to show you. So then, is it um, um... I have a YouTube video called Islamophobia. Um, here. If you write my name on uh, YouTube, Father, Soliman like that, not uh, as written uh, on the presentation. Soliman, and you write with it. Yeah, yeah because, because the word I wrote is Suleiman. This is how it is in Arabic, yes. But now I'm known in the West as Soliman, okay? So when you write it like that, it gets you a lot of videos on the internet. Islamophobia, okay? Uh, maybe if you write Hong Kong, this would be good because there are several, uh, several uh, uh, videos. The one in Hong Kong is the one that I uh, discussed fitna. Actually, I played fitna for non-Muslims there in Hong Kong University. Then I asked them, hmm, how do you feel now yeah, about Islam? They said, we now hate it so much. I said, good, are you ready now to see? And I showed them the verses and what he did, because Herr Tilders was having the on-off switch in his hand of the subtitles. He turns off the subtitles whenever he wants. Watch this YouTube video. It's a, it's a long one, but it shows you everything. Actually, the first 20 minutes is just fitna. If you saw fitna before, you don't need to, you have to skip the first 20 minutes. And go directly to what he did to you. Amazing. Another question? I thank you for coming. I only saw you on Twitter. <laughs> I like it from the beginning to the end. Only one thing struck me. That is when you told me uh, about the rules uh, the Prophet gave for uh, treating prisoners of war. Yes. And he said you, they shouldn't be tortured. Sure. And then you came with a very, in my opinion, tricky example where uh, prisoners of war were, were uh, tortured. And the Prophet said, don't torture them because they don't tell you lies. I thought it was an ethical principle and some lies more a pragmatic principle. Yes, of course. Thank you very much. Actually, he told them, you are torturing them and they tell you lies, which means you cannot extract uh, information in an investigation through torture. This is unethical and the information is unreliable too. So, he said, this is not the way investigators should do. There's another way for investigation. That's what he did. Yes, of course. Yes, of course. An investigator can ask many questions or some questions that are indirect to get the information from the suspects. There's no problem with that. I think the remark was about why is it was it an ethical reason not to torture or just a pragmatic reason because you don't get any useful information from them? No, because it's ethical too. Because in another in another uh, occasion. He refused to take out the incisors 
of a propagandist who speaks and makes speeches and makes poetry against him. He said, I'm not going to do that. That's it. It's about the rule, but about the sound. Okay, sure, sure. Thank you. Good remark, thank you. One question about, um, I did elaborate on the whole topic of the war. Yeah. Um, I've lived in Egypt for a year in Libya, and I tried to learn Arabic, and I can tell you it's pretty difficult for somebody who's not grown up with it. Um, so, what I'm just kind of asking you, if you have somebody, say, say from Afghanistan, he's going to study, and, and this person wants to know what he is believing in, then you can choose from where you want to pick. If you want to pick a translated version of the Quran, if you want to listen to a preacher, but any of them could be wrong. So how can you tell, like, how can this person find what he's supposed to believe in? Very good, thank you. Well, we have two sources, Quran and the authentic Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, anything else can be right and wrong. So people should not be fans of anyone. Yes, I can love my sheikh, I can love my scholar, but at the same time, when I listen to him, I expect that what he is telling me is can be right and can be wrong at the same time. Because actually, we have the Quran and the Sunnah, and the, the very important things are stated there clearly. Very clearly. There are some other things that are left for the intellect. And because our minds are not the same, you can have a variety of opinions, of course. <laughs> but here comes the role of you, as someone who hears, to judge between those scholars who tell you some things and to judge which one should be right, which one should be wrong. Um, would you consider Osama bin Laden a Muslim? Yes, he's a Muslim, of course, because we cannot say that someone is not a Muslim, but we can say that a, a Muslim can do sins, a Muslim can do wrong things. So, of course, I, uh, uh, I don't know him personally, so I didn't hear from him. I heard about him, and I heard about him very bad things. So what I heard about him, most of it is wrong, is bad. What he did from this is wrong. What he didn't do and was said about him, then he's innocent from. This is the issue. I cannot judge someone that I didn't hear from directly. But what I heard about him was totally bad. was very bad, actually. So I can say that as a Muslim speaker or a scholar, if I can call myself, well, I'm not a scholar, but the issue is a Muslim scholar should not judge and should not <coughs> talk about names, should talk about uh, issues, should talk about concepts. And then these concepts, if they fall on Osama bin Laden or the Taliban or whatever, then it's then the, the so I should speak generally. But when you tell me, do you consider Osama bin Laden Muslim? Yes. I cannot get someone out of Islam if he says I'm a Muslim. But among Muslims, we have good people. The reason why you are asking this because the Christian background is that if you're a Christian, you're saved. In Islam, no. In Islam, if you're Muslim, you're not saved yet. Actually, Islam is the only religion that I know about which guarantees punishment for its followers on the day of judgment if they don't do good work. So if you say, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, there is no God except Allah, Muhammad is a messenger of Allah. This doesn't mean that you're going to paradise. In Islam, the concept of salvation is different from the concept of salvation in other religions. In Islam, the concept of salvation is a bird that flies with two wings. With one wing, it won't fly, it will fall down. So one wing is faith, and the other wing is good work. So you always find in the Quran, it is mentioned like that. الصالحات, those who believe and do good work. Those who believe and do good work. If you just believe, that's not enough. That's not. Becoming a Muslim is not a visa that uh, 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 qualifies you to go to paradise. So saying that someone is a Muslim, yes, he's a Muslim. It doesn't mean that he's saved. I'm not a Christian. I know that. I know that. Maybe. maybe. I, I, no, I, I, say, I do believe that the Protestantism is very similar. Yeah, okay. For, for okay. That's why I say Christian background. I know that many of you are not Christians. But at least from a Christian background or a Jewish background. Uh, one question? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm not a Christian. Uh, 
question is for Abhi, no? I mean, I have two questions. Sure. The first question is that uh, I've been in a Muslim world, a Muslim world that is doing justice. I can give you an example of Musa Arabia. There's a lot of points there. How do you think that the people who fight uh, verbal uh, jihad and uh, the spirit of jihad of uh, October? What we did in Egypt was verbal jihad and it worked, alhamdulillah. And what happened in Tunisia was verbal jihad and it worked, alhamdulillah. And uh, the second question is, uh, I've seen here the news uh, uh, the last two uh, weeks, people from here, from Europa, from Belgium, or from Holland, they go to fight in Syria. How do you think? People, what is the priority? People who live here in uh, Europa, Good. what's the priority to go to jihad of the <coughs> Thank you very much. That's an excellent question. Actually, I believe that the Muslims of Europe can help the Muslim world, can help Palestine, can help Syria if they integrate in Europe, if they participate in politics. But they are not. And this is the issue. They are not taking Prophet Muhammad as an example. Prophet Muhammad, our example, was an immigrant. He left Mecca with tears in his eyes and he said, Oh Mecca, let know that you are the dearest country to my heart and had not your people get me out of you, I could have never left you. After eight years, Mecca was opened back for him and he didn't go back to live there because he integrated fully in the new country, Medina, which supported him and he gave it all the good that he has. So the same thing should happen with Muslims who are immigrants. Your example is Prophet Muhammad. He integrated fully. After eight years, he said, Oh Allah, let know that I love Medina and the people of Medina. And if the people of Medina go anywhere, I'll be going with them. <coughs> to the extent that he changed some aspects of his culture. As long as it does not contradict with his religion. To prove it. Lady Aisha is coming back from a wedding and he said, hmm, did you have fun? He said, yeah, we had fun. He said, what did you sing? He said, no, we didn't sing. He said, how come you don't sing in a wedding, you Meccans? You Meccans are not in Mecca anymore. You are here in Medina. And the people of Medina love singing. Why didn't you sing? Ataynakum, ataynakum. And he even suggested a song that could have been suitable to be sang in a wedding. Yes, he did not compromise his religion. <coughs> Whatever from his culture that he can adapt to uh, integrate, he did and he integrated and he was influential. The issue is, how can Muslims in Europe be influential? And look at themselves as European Muslims who can help their brothers in the Muslim world. This, this issue is very important. Do they need men in Syria? Do they lack men? If they lack men, go. But they don't lack men. They lack political support from Europe. Because Muslims in Europe are not doing their work. This is why I think. They, you had a second question, right? You said two questions. The second question was how do you think the Anywhere. We, what we did in the, in the revolution was verbal jihad. And the one who actually killed us and, and shot at us was him. We did not do any violence to him. So actually, yes, I believe anywhere when there is injustice, people should go out and speak the truth and tell time that they are tyrants. Yes. Um, yeah, I would like to ask you, um, you as uh, someone who is communicating between uh, religions and uh, explaining the Islam, yes. um, what do you think about the way how the Western media is using the term Jihad. Do you think it's a lack of knowledge or do you think it's on purpose to generate tensions? Uh, you will have one of my DVDs which is Jihad on Terrorism and I think in the first 10 minutes uh, you will find uh, that we are bringing you samples from the Western media when Jihad was against the Soviets. You will see how they were using the term Jihad saying 4,000 Mujahideen in Kandahar are now fighting the Soviets. Jihad is now launched against the Soviets. Highly about Jihad. And then Jihad became a term that means terrorism. <coughs> Some people are caught 
and they are trialed in some countries with the charge of planning for jihad. Jihad means establishing justice. Jihad means war against terrorism. This is the issue. So I think, yes, of course, the media is playing a, a, an unclean game when it comes to the term jihad, of course. And it is the role of Muslims to go out and explain. Listen, the media was playing also against Prophet Muhammad. And there's a chapter called the journalists in the Quran. It's not called journalists, it's called the poets. The poets of that time were the journalists of the day. It speaks about journalists, about media people, and what they do. And how did the Prophet uh, went combating this bad journalism that manipulates the truth is by encouraging good Muslim journalists, professional journalists. So he had his own Muslim poets like Hassan ibn Thabit, Ka'b ibn Malik, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, whom their poetry was not technically less than any other poetry. The issue, so the issue. I believe Muslims, listen, as in the, in the Muslim world and in the Muslim houses here, we always tell our kids, I want to see you a good engineer or a good doctor. That's what we do. None of us tells his kid, I want to see you a good journalist. We don't do that. Only when they are unable to join the faculty of engineering or medicine, they become, this is terrible. So the issue is, Muslims should focus on the gaps. And among the gaps is journalism. I want to see you a good journalist. <laughs> okay? I, I'm always telling my son, I want to be a journalist. Okay, more questions. Yeah, there are about 600, 700 years before, between Jesus Christ and the Quran, about 300 years between the New Testament and the Quran, and you said the last revelation was the Quran. And since then, there were 1,400 40, 40, 40, years. Yes. How are you sure? How is what? How are you sure that the Quran is lost revelation? Ah, uh, that nothing comes later? Yeah. Because the Quran itself says so. The Quran, <laughs> the Quran itself. Yes, the Quran itself. Uh, well, well, that's, a, that's a beautiful question, actually. Let me tell you. Uh, someone came to my office once. He's from Colombia. And he said, listen, I watched all your videos, the two documentaries, and I loved it. And I think that I'm inclined towards Islam. There's only one thing that's troubling me. He said, what? He said, why are you guys closing the door behind you? Why do you say that Muhammad is the final prophet? Don't you think that with all the problems in this world, this world needs a prophet? I said, no, it doesn't need a prophet. And I had a bottle of water in, on, my, on my desk. It was from Nestle. I said, this is a product of Nestle. It went through production phases. In the beginning, they brought the plastic powder. They heated it. They blew it into a bottle. They brought the water, they filtered it, and they poured it inside, and then they sealed it. Now I perfected for you the religion. This is the verse of the Quran. So prophets for us are production phases of the religion, the one religion of God. So it will come time when it is perfected. Now it doesn't need any more production. It needs what? Distribution. It needs people like you and me to go out and propagate the message. So we don't need more prophets because the, prof, the last and final prophet is the seal of the prophets. That's it. So the issue is, that's what I believe, because I believe the Quran and I believe Prophet Muhammad. And those who came after him were carrying different messages, of course. Some people claim to be prophets. We don't believe that they are prophets. That's it. Jesus himself, by the way, warned from false prophets who will appear after him. And that's what Christians use against Prophet Muhammad. But he didn't say that everyone that will appear is a false prophet. But he said, be careful of false messiahs. Sure. 
actually in John, well, Christ says uh, that when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will perfect the religion. Okay? And he will be with you and he will bring glory to me. He will glorify me. As Muslims, we believe that he meant Prophet Muhammad. Because Prophet Muhammad's name was As-Sadiq al which means the spirit of truth. The truthful. Okay? Christians say that he meant the spirit, uh, the, the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was speaking about someone who will come in the future. And the Holy Spirit existed at the time of Jesus. There are two things about Islam that uh, are shocking uh, for the Western world. Sure. Uh, the possibility of having several wives <laughs> and uh, the dress code of women. In many countries, in some countries, it has been even... Definitely, women. definitely. What do you have to say about uh, that? Thank you so much for this question. <laughs> uh, Uh, let's talk first about the first one until I bring you something good to, to see actually about the dress code. But talking about what are you reading? That's my email inbox. Huh? <laughs> no, that's not. Ah, yeah. Uh, the first one was what? I'm sorry. I'm, I have a monotype for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. I said that Islam is a religion for all people. And, okay, I'll, I'll read this now. Islam is a religion, as I said, for all people. From the Eskimo to the Amazons. And people have different cultures. There are cultures who accept this issue as a solution for their problems. I have a personal experience. I have an aunt who lived a 39 years love story with her husband. And she was never able to have children. Eight years ago, she said to her husband, I want to see the dream coming true in my house. She took him and she married him to another wife. And she took for them an apartment in the same building. The new wife became pregnant. The first baby was a girl. She named her Hanan after my aunt's name. The man goes to work and the two women today take breakfast every day together and three children are playing around them. If there are people who accept this solution for their problems, who are we to prevent it? But Islam doesn't make it an obligation of people. I'm married to one woman. Nearly everyone I know is married to only one woman. In Egypt, the last census says that 97 point something are only single marriages in Egypt. I think 1.8% are double marriages. They found 0. 0.000 something, someone married to three women. They didn't find anyone crazy enough to marry four women. <laughs> so the issue is, the issue is, Islam allows it, doesn't obligate it. And Islam restricted it because it existed before Islam. Islam restricted it to the number four maximum. Don't go and exaggerate. <laughs> exactly. Maximum four under conditions of being extremely just, which means you spend here one dollar, you spend here one dollar. You, this one, this one lives, would live in a, in a four, uh, uh, bedroom apartment, then this one will live in a four bedroom apartment, not something less. This is the issue. So Islam allowed it because people come from different cultures. But cultures that don't accept it, they don't have to practice it. Okay, this is one. Second. Okay. There's also, uh, in Holland, they also talk about uh, that there are stories about Mohammed's life, that's married with kids. That he? Married with kids. Married with kids. And that's also the people about Islam. That what? That's, that's something people don't understand. Yes, of course. So, um, where is it written exactly? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, no, it's not written, actually. We, 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 it is in the biography of Prophet Muhammad that uh, 
he married several wives, and one of them was Lydia Aisha, who said he uh, married me, the contract was when I was seven, and the marriage was consummated when I was nine, and he died when I was 18. So here people say, well, then he was a pedophile. Well, a pedophile won't marry only one in the age of nine. He will marry all the rest in the age of the same age. But that's not true. That's not what happened. Many of his wives were actually old women, older than him, much older than him. So if we talk about Prophet Muhammad's marriages, now five minutes is good. Just allow me for five minutes to talk about this. OK, good. Halas, this is the last question before we go. Halas, allow me. Yeah, because this, this question is extremely important. Extremely important. It's extremely important. Because Prophet Muhammad is someone important for us. And we want people to understand. Prophet Muhammad, his enemies said everything about him. They said he's a liar, he's a sorcerer, he's a magician, his, his soul is a crazy. But none of them said he's a pedophile or a child molester. Number one, why? Did they forget to be against him? It could have been an excellent chance to destroy this man and destroy this new religion. But they didn't use it. This issue, we only hear it recently in the, fir in the past 20, 30 years. Even though it is known that he married one of his wives in that young age. Prophet Muhammad did not marry until he became 25. And he was known for being a very chaste person. He, never, he was never a womanizer or never chasing women, ever. So even his enemy did not use this against him. And when he got married, he got married to Lady Khadija, who was 15 years older than him. She was 40 and he was 25. And they, they were married for 25 years, which means she became 65 and he became 50. And then she died and he stayed unmarried for three years. So where is the last here? And then the first one that he married was Lady Sauda bint Zama, who was in the same age of Lady Khadija, around 70 years old. And then Lady Aisha in the age of nine. And then, and then, and then others. Some of them died in his life, by the way, and they were old. And some were not normal in the 20s and the 30s. And Lady Aisha, she was the only one who was at that age. The issue is, why did Prophet Muhammad wait from the age seven when he signed the contract, or when they made the contract, until the age of nine. What was he waiting for? Puberty. Who said that when a girl reaches puberty, then she's ready for marriage? The Encyclopedia Britannica. Go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and type puberty. It will tell you puberty is the phase at which an adult becomes uh, ready for procreation. Physically. So she was ready physically, but who said that she was mature enough? Maybe girls when they reach puberty are not mature enough. Let's see if Lady Aisha was mature enough or not. Two years after marriage, which means she was 11 when this incident happened, the hypocrites accused her of committing adultery with someone. And when she heard about the rumors and what's happening, she felt ill and she told the prophet i want to go and stay in my uh, parents house he said go and then he went to visit her she is narrating she said he sat on my bed and he said how are you aish she was ill I said i'm okay he said listen aish if you committed a sin ask forgiveness from allah but if you are innocent, let know that Allah will prove your innocence. Any man who is put in this situation, God forbid, he will at least shake his wife and tell her, I want to know the truth. He said, ask forgiveness between you and Allah. And then she looked at her mother and she said, answer the Prophet of Allah. She's her mother and she will be defending her. Her mother, because for a whole month there were rumors and people speaking, she said, I don't know what to say to the Prophet. She said, I looked at my father and I said, answer the Prophet of Allah. Her father said, I don't know what to say to the Prophet. So it was her turn to defend herself. 
So she looked at them and she said, I know that you heard it again and again and again until you believed it inside you. And if I tell you that I am innocent, you won't believe me. And if I tell you that I did it and sinned, you will believe me. So I'm not going to tell you anything. I don't find anything more fitting for me than the very words of Prophet Jacob, the son of Joseph, when he said, beautiful patience is what is most fitting for me. And she turned her back to them, she said, and she said, I was crying until I felt like my liver would be torn apart. But I was sure that Allah will prove my innocence. But I never expected that Allah will descend verses from above seven heavens to be recited in the Quran until the end of time, proving my innocence. I only wished that Prophet Muhammad would see a vision in his sleep, proving my innocence. So she was mature and she reached puberty. Plus, a child molester loves his molester or hates his molester? Hates. Okay. If you want to read the perfect love story, don't read Romeo and Juliet. Romeo actually committed, uh, um, uh, he threw himself on the balcony, I think, or he, yeah, he, yeah, he, he committed uh, suicide. Read Muhammad and Aisha. In the words of Aisha, Aisha herself is speaking about how beautiful this relationship was. And that she was always very proud that the Prophet died in her arms. She said when he used to enter, and I'm eating or drinking, he used to take the cup and drink from my same cup and make me see that he's putting his lips on the same place where I put my lips. She said, when I'm having even my menses. But at that time, the Jews were not eating with their women when they have their menses. They segregate them, okay? She said, he used to put my head on my lap and recite the Quran, even when I'm having my menses. She said, he used to race with me. And in the beginning, I used to win. After that, I gained weight. He started to win, and I feel bad. He tells me, hey, come on, Aisha. You win before. And she spoke about how beautiful husband he was. She said that when she used to say, oh my God, I have a headache, he used to say, it's me who can feel your headache in my head. So he was a very gentle husband. She loved him so much, and that's not the tone of a molested child. She reached puberty, and let me tell you that, if a 53-year-old person today, here, in... Uh, oh, no, give me a minute, one minute, and I'll finish. <laughs> okay? If, if a 53-year-old person marries a nine-year-old girl today in Cairo or here in Holland, it's wrong. It's wrong. But maybe today somewhere else is not wrong. Maybe here 200 years ago was not wrong. So when you say something is wrong, you need to say wrong because it's a violation of what? The law or the customs of people. It was neither the law nor the customs of people. Actually, one of his wives was Lady Safiya who was the daughter of the king of the Jews in Arabia. He was her third husband, and she was in the age of 14. What do you think well, her first husband uh, married her when she was in the age of what? Probably nine or 10. So neither the Jews criticized him for this, nor the pagans, nor even anyone in Europe until the 30 years ago or 20 years ago. When things changed and customs changed, Many, maybe some of us here, their grandmothers got married in the age of 12 or 13 or 14. Here, I'm telling you now, in, the, in our generation. So what do you think about 1500 years ago? A completely different people, psychologically, physiologically. So we shouldn't really judge them with our own laws and our own customs now. Okay. Thank you. I have only two minutes to answer uh, the question about the Muslim women outfit. Uh, uh, I know that uh, many of you wonder why are Muslim women wearing like that? Uh, they look weird. Uh, they look like uh, uh, aliens coming from outer space. Uh, but actually, I want you to tell me uh, whose picture is this? Maria. Maria. Who's Maria? Mother of Jesus. And uh, actually, uh, of course, the Christians call her the mother of God. 
um, Muslims uh, look at her as a very respectable woman. Actually, by the Quran, she is the purest woman who ever walked the face of the earth. She is not the mother of God, but she is the mother of Jesus, son of Mary. We have a whole chapter called after this woman, and she is an Israelite, that she's not an Arab. And this woman is, hmm, who knows who this woman is? Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa is a very kind-hearted woman. She founded so many organizations that are helping the poor and the needy all over the world. <clears throat> and I think uh, Christians look at those two women as the best two women uh, in their eyes. And this is my sister. And the question that I have for you, what is common in the view of them? They are totally covered except faces and hands. Muslim women do not wear like that because Mother Mary or Mother Teresa was wearing like that. It's because <clears throat> it is a direct command from God to the Muslim woman. It is not hijab, <clears throat> it's not the sign of authority of the man over the woman like some people think. Some countries that banned hijab were trying to help the Muslim woman get rid of the authority of the man. But that's not the case at all. It's a direct command from God to the Muslim woman in the Quran. The Almighty said in a chapter called The Light. It says, and say to the believing men, it doesn't say women here, that they should <coughs> lower the gaze and cover the private parts. That is purer for them and Allah is aware of all that they do. The next verse says, and say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and cover their private parts. That they should not display their beauty except that which is apparent and to draw their veils over their bosoms and not to reveal their beauty except to their husbands, their fathers, their husband's fathers, their sons, their husband's sons, their uh, brothers and their brother's sons and their sister's sons, which means that Muslim women are not all the time wearing like that. In front of close relatives, they are wearing normally showing their hair and their arms, but give me one more minute. But why do Muslim women wear like that? It's because men have been using women as tools of enjoyment. Uh, Dr. Susan Fisk, she's a non-Muslim uh, doctor of uh, uh, psychology in Princeton University. In her recent research, she found that when men look at women who are wearing revealing clothes or very tight clothes, the part of their brain which is utilized is the same part which is utilized when men look at mechanical tools. Men use women as tools of enjoyment. When a man is having some depression, he goes out to, a, to Starbucks, he buys a frappuccino, and he sits by the window or outside to watch women, not men. After two hours, he's feeling good. He goes home. He stands there to the women, Enough is enough. Cover up. You are not for public use. They are not going to use you like that. So the issue is, so right now I am doing my latest documentary. We filmed in 11 countries with 12 female converts. And most of them said that in the hijab they found freedom from being used as a tool by men to enjoy their hair, their bodies and so on. So hijab is not the sign of authority of the man over the woman in Islam. Why do people in the West think so? Again, because of that, I'm sorry, the Christian mindset. Look at the book of Corinthians in the Bible. Paul is saying, for if a woman will not veil herself, then her hair should be cut off. But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to be shaved, she should wear a veil. For a man ought not to have his head veiled, since he is the image and reflection of God. But a woman is the reflection of man. Indeed, man was not made from the woman, but the woman from the man. Neither was man created for the sake of the woman, but the woman for the sake of the man. For this reason, a woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. This is not in Islam. In Islam, it's a direct command from God to the woman. That's it. So the problem is, in communities that are either Christian or have a Christian background, they think that Islam is like that. Islam is totally against any authority of the man over the woman. Both men and women are equal before God. 
equal before the law, both of them are subject to be equally rewarded or equally punished by God and by the law. But the issue is, what we see is different, it's true. In some societies, Muslim societies and non-Muslim societies, Muslim women are discriminated against. Let me conclude this by saying, if any society or individual oppresses women or discriminates against them, it is against Islam, not because of it. But some people apply their own cultures and old traditions and flavor them with the flavor of Islam, which is not doing justice to Islam. Thank you very much. I will leave the floor to my brother.